Hey everyone, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that um, the previous speaker did such a great job showing you a lot of the um, beautiful landscapes of Louisiana, especially in central Louisiana, because when Tammany asked me to give this talk, I went, oh, I'm, I'm not a native plant person. I mean, I love native plants and I put them in my yard and I know they're important, but I'm a spider person, I'm an insect person. So um, I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of that part, but your challenge today is to figure out the interconnectedness of the native plants with my creepy crawlies that I'll teach you about. Um, but before I get to that, let me give you just a background of why I do what I do and how I got to where I am, because I think you'll realize the apple doesn't fall very far if you know my, my dad, Dr. Bob. Um, and so just a couple of pictures from my past that I like to use when, uh, when I'm talking actually to student groups and trying to motivate them and let them figure out what their passions are and things like that. I thought, well, this is a group that's going to be passionate about native plants. They'll understand what I'm talking about here. And so here's a couple of pictures just kind of highlight my upbringing. One picture I don't have that I'm real sad about is where I really grew up was at the Louisiana Nature Center in eastern New Orleans. If any of y'all have been there before, my dad was the founding director. So I was there all the time. So my hands were always dirty. My feet were always, you know, bare and dirty. And I was always out uh, tromping around in the woods. Um, but this picture up here on the top left is a picture of me and my sister. And I'm, I'm glad to know that a couple of you in here know my sister. So this will really resonate. But I love this picture. It's um, when dad was the, uh, the director of the Nature Center. And we went out with a bunch of scientists and naturalists into the Atchafalaya. And um, here I, we walk up together. I guess dad snapped this picture. And it's great because my sister's on the right to y'all and holding this nice, beautiful bouquet of flowers. And then I'm on the left with a dead paddlefish. And so she now is in insurance. And here I am, the field biologist. And so, you know, the apple doesn't fall far. And, and I learned my passion very early and, and what I really loved. Um, the bottom two left uh, pictures that are black and white from my high school days is from my yearbook. Um, I didn't realize it then, but once I became a professional, I was like, oh my gosh, there's pictures of me when I was doing what I loved in high school even. And all my friends were telling me I was a nerd. And I was like, yeah, I am. Um, so that was, uh, those are pictures captured from our science club events that we held. Um, the bottom left one, you can't read this because it's so small, but it says science club members know it's cool to recycle glasses. And so this was in the 90s and here we are, you know, we're collecting glasses and trying to recycle them. And then on the right side up there in the black and white, I'm, I'm standing up and it was my senior year and I wanted to be more involved, but I wasn't an officer at that point. And, um, and I, I said, well, can I just stand up weekly and talk about one way you can reduce your impact on the environment? because I was really into it and I was hearing it all the time at home. And, and so they said, sure, you, you can do that. So I would stand up once a week and it, they, they called it a May on the Environment. And so I would say little things, and this was an all-girls Catholic high school. That's important to know for this story because I would say things like, um, you know, you can, when you go to the bathroom, you don't have to flush the toilet every time. You know, like, remember, when it's yellow, let it mellow. And if it's brown, flush it down. And of course, all the girls were like, ah! Um, but but I, I tell that story simply so you realize that this has been inside of me for a long time and my passions have grown from there. And so it won't surprise you that I now study insects and spiders. Um, and so, and I love to get, uh, you know, down and dirty and do outreach and anything that I can to get the next generation excited. And, um, and y'all are my generation, the next generation, generation ahead of me. So here we are, I can now tell uh, multiple generations to get excited and passionate about the spiders and hopefully teach you a few things today that will help you to maybe appreciate them more, maybe share stories more. Um, but the challenge is always, because it's a native plant society group, is what is the interconnectedness? What is the vital role and, and how we weave together this idea of native plants and, um, and spiders? So we weave, weave that vital web. Yep, exactly. So when I went to um, undergraduate, 
followed a traditional path, got my biology degree, studied environmental biology, and then graduate school was really great. Um, the previous speaker talked about doing some of that work on um, at Fort Johnson. I actually was paid as a graduate student to study, um, to do aquatic biomonitoring of invertebrates at, um, at a, a place, Camp Shelby, which is in, um, I was at Southern Miss, so uh, Southeast Mississippi. And so I, you know, sometimes I think about that and I'm like, well, the government paid me to determine if their bombing was having an effect in an adverse way on the environment or not. And then the follow-up question I was always, yeah. Does it? Did it? Well, not on the aquatic macroinvertebrates. So you have to ask my colleagues who did the plant studies and, and the other work on it. But from our perspective, it wasn't. So we can have that conversation later. But it paid for my graduate degree. And um, I ended up studying and getting to know spiders a lot more because I did some field studies. But mainly I did some lab studies on a species of spider shown there in the top right. That is um, one of our largest species we have in Louisiana. That is a uh, a fishing spider. Dolomites vitatus is that species right there, and that's the common name is fishing spider. Um, and so I was looking at them, and I was raising them in my lab, and learned all kinds of really cool behavior, but ended up doing my work on um, seeing if they had, if they altered the uh, foraging ecology of salamanders, particularly the um, spotted salamander that you see from egg mass to larva um, to adult in those pictures, and then another species um, Ambystema talpoidium, which is the small nose um, salamander, and um, and so far no. So the follow up would have been, is it because of their toxicity? Um, but I changed direction, and I actually got hired as a professor at that time, and I uh, ended up teaching at Southern Miss for about 10 or 11 years and then finished up my PhD in STEM education because of my passion for education. So hopefully that prepared me to actually be a college professor because most college professors don't get training in how to teach and yet they go and teach. So here we are today. <laughs> so anyway, so let me take you on this little journey. Um, I'm now at Loyola University, New Orleans. Very lucky to be there. It's a uh, what we refer to in the academic world as a PUI, which is a primarily undergraduate institution and that's important to know because I don't have graduate students so all of the research that I and, and a higher teaching load of course um, so I get to do a lot of projects with or all of my projects with undergraduates that limits me in questions that I can ask and the amount of time I can be in the lab um, but it also allows for me to ask the types of questions that still need to be asked about spiders and a lot of those are about the natural history of spiders because they're an understudied group of organisms for one reason or another. You can come up with your own opinion. Um, so anyway, here I am um, on the left side. That's a group of entomology students that I took in the field a few years ago. And then on the right, during the pandemic, um, I taught a, a class where we really dove into um, understanding about native plantings um, in a different capacity, not necessarily for what I'm used to studying them for, for pollination um, and insects and, and benefits of the ecosystem, but more to provide food in a food desert in the city of New Orleans. So that is a, um, an urban farm right there. If you've heard of recirculating farms, it's on Jackson Avenue. And uh, so we got to do some work out there and, and um, make the connections of environmental injustices and, and um, importance of growing native uh, plants that you can actually eat. And a lot of our students are now growing their own plants because, and I think it has stemmed from the pandemic when we were home for a while and, and doing things like that, which is pretty cool. So this is from your website. Hopefully you recognize that. <laughs> when you look at the native flora of, if you narrow it down just to our state, it's easier to break down the different regions into eco-regions because we do have so many different habitats. And so um, because I'm a spider person, I decided, well, I'll just start with this, and that's where your challenge comes in to make the, the interconnect, uh, interconnections um, among the different groups and on the right is the other part of this poster that is a beautiful poster and I, now that I have found it I will use it in some of my classes um, but I decided just to take a couple of your snapshots from your um, website and show you some of my favorite are bottomland hardwood forest and swamps it's where I've done a lot of my work at Jean Lafitte and other places great place for me to go as um, as a teacher to show students the importance of our coastal plains and how you can go from especially 
especially at Jean Lafitte, um, Barataria unit, very easily in like a couple of miles from um, the the swamp. In well, you can talk about the remnants of the Mississippi River into the swamp, into the marsh, and and beyond. So um, great, great location. And uh, we did a study on spiders out there recently, and hopefully that'll be published soon. Um, and then of course, longleaf pine savanna is near and dear to my heart because of where I uh, did my graduate work. Um, and so I know we have a lot of those places, uh, a lot of that habitat in our state. And then when I found out that my uncle, um, who's Larry Alain here, um, was going to be here, I was like, oh, well, I got to grab a picture of a coastal prairie because that's, you know, his, his jam. <laughs> just say it like that, just for fun. So, um, so there's your coastal prairie. So what does this have to do with my critters. Well, I thought I would start big and, and kind of help you. If you've never learned or, or most of you probably haven't studied spiders, I figured. And so I'll start big and, and ask a couple of questions. If you learn about a spider and you want to know more about it, there are certain things you have to know first. You have to know where it resides. In other words, what is it comparable to? What is it like in, um, in the world of animals? We know it's an animal, but let's break it down. So if we start big, do y'all love your taxonomy? You've been using scientific names all day. Okay, so if we start with the domain, or we skip the domain, we skip the kingdom, because I think y'all know that at this point. Um, we would go to the phylum to which they belong, and I have a couple of examples of organisms that are in this phylum. So if you can see that picture clear enough, see how many you can name in your head. Um, Arthropoda means jointed appendage. So any of the organisms that are animals that have jointed appendages and in addition to that, and I know this is very small for you in the back, I didn't realize the room would be like this, sorry. So let me read out the other characters that, that they share in common. In addition to having jointed appendages, these are organisms, these are animals that also have a protective layer known as an exoskeleton. Exo means outside. So having a skeleton on the, X side of X, uh, on the outside of the body, a segmented body, and then those paired jointed appendages. So if you could name many of these organisms, great. They are common in our landscapes. They are good for aerating our soils. They are good for um, serving other ecosystem services like being a prey item or being a predator and controlling um, outbreaks and, and um, you know, anything from getting too high in, um, in its numbers, in its population. All right, that's a lot of critters. Millions of critters, uh, different species, that belong to the phylum Arthropoda. So we would narrow it down by focusing then on just the class of organisms to which spiders belong, which is the class Arachnida, which is Greek for a spider, even though um, most of the organisms in this grouping are not spiders. Only one um, order is a spider. So you've got several things up there that you probably recognize, like a scorpion, um, Some, if you've ever been to the tropics, things like tailless whip scorpions, just some really neat critters. Their shared characters is that they all have eight walking legs, which is, I think y'all all know what eight walking legs um, entails, but they also have two body regions, which I'll go into deeper in just a minute, and then two characters that are lesser known if you haven't studied this uh, group of organisms known as chalicery and pedipalps. All right, so keep those in mind. I'll come back to those too. But that's still a lot of organisms, so we've got to narrow it down even more. So if we take it one more level down in taxonomy, we get to the order to which all spiders belong, which is order Araneae, um, Spanish araña, and then the, it's Latin um, arani, a spider. So arachne means a spider, arani means a spider, araña, if you can roll your R's, <laughs> a spider. So lots of different ways to describe that order of um, invertebrates. This is a group that is not well studied. I've already said that. I'm saying it again because as I was sitting back here earlier listening to all these talks, I thought, you know, I wonder what the number of described species is today uh, of the spiders. So I quickly grabbed a screenshot shown there on the right. So that's current as of February 24th, 2024 of, and the x-axis is time, and the first date over there is 1750, and the last date is 20, I think 
think it says 2025 maybe. So it's, it's extending up. And what this is, is the number of currently valid species described, spider species described per year based on the World Spider Catalog, which is kept in, in Europe in a, in a museum there. And so you can see what kind of, wait, what is that called? There are graduate students in here. What is that curve called? Okay, good. Um, so you see that exponential curve where in the past, since I've been um, a professional the past 25, 30 years, it has really increased at a rapid pace. So that tells you um, as an ecologist or as somebody who's interested in or, uh, organisms and, and knowing what organisms are, what their names are, describing new species, this is a field where you can go and learn um, and, and discover new species. So there's a whole lot out there to learn. Um, so I say all of that just to let you know that, that we're in some, we're still in some basic uh, research stages uh, in the spider world, if you want to think of it like that. So there are approximately 135 families of spiders around the world. Um, in, the, uh, in the entire world, as of today, 51,939. So I had put up there earlier approximately 50,000. Well, I could update it based on today because the website gets updated every day. So that's a that's a, a good number. I mean, what does that mean? It means that, I mean, so flowering plants, there's over 250,000 species. So it's nothing compared to you flowering plants. They are not radiating at the same speed. They're definitely not, um, well, as far as we know, um, they're, they're definitely not as uh, specious as some of the groups. But compare it to something like an amphibian that are highly studied. What is it, like 4,600 species of amphibians that we know of worldwide? It's not a big number. So um, in North America, we have about 4,000 species, and nobody's done the work on the entire state to know exactly how many species we have here. There, um, there's been a lot of work done um, by um, Hardy, and, um, and so we know a lot of the species in the north, well, central and north, um, northern part of the state, but not much in the southern part. So I'm hoping to knock that out as, as I go through my career, and we've already started doing it. Um, but about 2017, we finally got our first um, little pamphlet that is specific for spiders of Louisiana. So, um, so this is very cheap, you know, easy thing to put. Thank, I love it. I didn't do it. I wish I could take credit for it. Um, but I use it all the time because it's a great uh, tool um, to just try to identify what spiders you have when you're in the field or, or in your yard or, or wherever. What's that? The rain itself. Oh, well, yes, people, yes, they're, and they're, they're, they're inexpensive for sure. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let me just give you some basic characters that, um, that want to take us forward, and then I want to tell you some fun stories, some strategies, and things like that that spiders um, implore to be successful and to, um, to be able to exist, really. Um, I mentioned about their uh, body divisions. So, Insects are better well known than spiders tend to be. So how many body segments does an insect have? Three. Bug lady, you can't answer. Okay. Um, three different body segments, and they are what? Yeah. Head, thorax, thorax abdomen. abdomen. Okay. So with spiders, with the rainiers, um, think of it as more like the head and the thorax are fused. And so the name we use to refer to that body segment is cephalothorax. Cephalo meaning highly cephalized or having nervous central nervous system up here. So that's the cephalothorax and then the abdomen. And so they are those two different body regions have different purposes. Um, if you look at the uh, very simple drawing at the top right over there, you can see that where the legs are attached, they're attached to the cephalothorax. Um, you can't really see the eyes well there, but the eyes would be near the front, the mouth parts. So it's a lot of sens uh, sensory and, um, and the different parts for sensing surroundings and, and being able to get food and, and uh, find mates and things like that. Four pair of walking legs, and actually you've probably seen, if you ever paid attention to spiders, they can walk with just two legs, um, even two on one side. There's all kinds of really cool things to dive into and learn about, but um, when you start studying them, you realize, okay, well they're supposed to have eight, but do they always? So you can't just use that characteristic when you're looking at them in the field because they do leave their, lose their legs, and as long as they're not sexually mature, they can grow new appendages, which is pretty cool because they have an exoskeleton that they have to molt in order to grow. Yeah, so um, 
I told you I'd get back to the other two characters that are important for this group. One of those is having a pair of chelicery. The chelicery are the mouth parts. And this picture right here, I got permission from the scientist a few years ago, um, whose name is up there, Michael Doe. He's, if you like to follow really cool macro photography, um, follow Michael Doe Project Maratus. He always has really great um, pictures up there. But I include this one, even though it's not our native Dinopus here, because you can really get a good look at the chelicerol um, basal segment and then those fangs hanging down right there. And I have been failing at photography for my entire life, so I am never going to get a picture that good. Um, so I always ask permission to use other people's photos. All right, so you're looking head on at um, an ogre faced spider, Dinopus subruffa. That one actually is from Australia. And so that's one thing to point out there. Then the other thing is, well, and, and the obvious is, okay, what are they for? Well, it's mouth parts, so it's for securing and holding prey in place. Um, and there are other purposes depending on the behaviors at the time. Defense, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've ever had a pet tarantula or known somebody that did, they will rear up like this and show you their fangs um, as a defense mechanism to uh, really tell you back off. Um, sometimes it is all bark, sometimes it's not just depends. So learn their behavior. All right. And then the, the fourth um, character that's listed up here is what's called pedipalps. And this is the only group of organisms that have and that we refer to as having pedipalps. They're comparable to antennae in insects. Um, they will use them for sensing. They will use them for holding prey in place when they have the prey in their chelicerol uh, mouth parts. But the really cool thing, and the reason, another reason I chose this picture, is that they also will use them for mating. So this right here, so that's the pedipalp. And it has, it's, it's um, got the same segments as their legs, one fewer segment, so they're not as long. Um, but the male, when he is sexually mature, will hold his sperm right here in the last segment of his pedipalps, and he will use them in different ways, depending on the species, in order to entice a female or try to defend um, a female or defend his prize, um, a, a, a fight with another male. Um, all kinds of really cool stories that, that you can learn about, and um, I'm, I'm happy to share some more after. I'm going to give you a couple of the different strategies that they use, but it's important to know that because when you send me a spider picture and I send back what it is or I say I can't tell because it's a juvenile or whatever, often when you see that you know it's a sexually mature male and so it's easier to identify. Just FYI when you send me those pictures, Hillary. No. <laughs> All right, so those characters... Oops switch back over here, um, are interesting and something that makes spiders unique. This is a, a scan electron um, micrograph of chelicerol basal segment here, so you're not seeing the entire thing, with hairs, sensory hairs. So they have hairs all over their body for sensing. You can see the attachment of the fangs. These are chelicerol teeth, and, and that's one of the characters that when we're identifying spiders and you have to look at them through a microscope, sometimes it comes down to looking at the number of teeth. It's very hard to do. It's probably one of the reasons people don't study them, because it's a lot of work. Um, but the really cool thing here is you can see an opening. And what do you think that opening's for? Yeah, yeah because all spiders that we know of except one family produce venom to use to um, secure and um, kill their prey. There's one family that we have in Louisiana. Um, the family name is Euliboridae. They are called the hackle mesh spiders. And I see them a lot under railings on trails, just if you want to go look for them, or under signs on trails in forests. And uh, they are one of those, uh, the species we have here is one that it takes its prey and, and just wraps it up and actually strangles it since it doesn't have a venom. On each side, one, two, has a little white dealy-do. Probably the lighting. It, when the picture was taken. Yeah, it's, I don't know 
if there is a function of it, I don't know what it is. It's on, yep. both, it's on both sides. Yep. So I, I think it has to do with the lighting because when we take pictures like this, it's always in a liquid because they dry out so fast and when they dry out, they're almost worthless. A little bit more of two characters that I think is fascinating and there's again there's so much more to learn about this and in fact um, over my profession I've learned a whole lot about this I am NOT a biochemist and um, one thing I failed to tell you is that I have a minor in chemistry because I don't want chemistry questions sorry and if there are any chemists in here you can help out I do try to teach myself some of these basics um, but when you look and you think about and you learn about spiders and their silk all spiders produce silk okay so that's a blanket statement you can make. Not all spiders produce silk to live in. So they don't all produce webs, but they can all produce silk. Um, whether that is for lining their homes, wrapping prey, uh, securing an egg sac, there are different purposes depending on the species. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a blanket statement there about the, the silk. One of the cooler things about it, and this is something you've, if you haven't seen before, Pay attention now that I'm going to hopefully give you a search image. But when you just are out and about, even in your front yard in an urban setting, if you just see what looks like a spider floating across the sky, it's probably a spider floating across the sky. Because one of the things that they do is they produce a drag line anytime they are trying to um, disperse or just move around in any kind of way. So a drag line is exactly as you might think. It is where they attach to something and then they either jump or they wait for the wind or something to take them. When you are out on a boat in the middle of the Gulf, let's say, um, you can see spiders out there doing this um, dispersing. It's called ballooning. And so they will sometimes just point their abdomen up into the air and wait for the wind to take the silk and allow themselves to be transported that way. So it's, it's one of the ways we think we've gotten some of the um, non-native species in our country. Do you want to wait the end of questions? I don't care. Well, is it a single strand or do they make a parachute? It depends. So mostly it's a single strand. Yep. Um, I have seen some that will uh, release several. Let, let me talk about that, how they can do that, because I think that's pretty cool. So you can barely see it here, but I thought this was such a great photo to show because this spider has its foot attached, its, its uh, claws attached to the line. This is a terrible picture of mine, but it's, it's one of my better pictures. But this is of a species that we see in, um, in Belize, and it, it's supposedly in Louisiana. I've never seen it, though. It's a um, lichen spider. But the cool thing about it is not only it's camouflage, but if you look right here, there are two appendages. This is its abdomen, and this is its cephalothorax. Um, those are the structures known as spinnerets. And keep it simple, spinnerets spin the silk. Right, so that's where the, the silk um, emerges from the body. And then this picture is really cool too. This is an, an, a very common orb weaver that we have creating its, um, it part of its orb web. And you can see it pulling the silk out of its spinnerets. Sometimes the spinnerets are more positioned ventrally. Sometimes they're more positioned um, posteriorly, so at the very end. So this picture I include right here just to show you some of the inner workings and this is just a, like a classic textbook picture for a spider class or an invert class and so I want to point out just th this right here. This green is showing you all of the glands that contribute to producing the silk. Okay, So that's what I would call now old school because since then we've now had lots of work done and by we not me but in the spider world and in the in the scientific field to help us understand about silk and so um, if you're fascinated by this there's a lot now to read and it's not only just in scientific journals now which is where it usually is first published there are now scientific America articles and things like that that are more readily digestible and so um, I, I want to just show you a couple things here um, to show you the different colors because in the previous picture it shows you the silk glands but but that's about it these different colors are associated with different proteins 
that are used for different types of silk for different purposes. So people always want to know, well, why doesn't a spider get stuck in its own silk? And it's because the spider is putting the sticky part of its web sticky to them, in certain places where it's going to be more effective at catching its prey, whereas it's not going to get caught up in it, it itself if it has to quickly divert um, a potential predator or something. Um, so one of the things I just pointed out was about the drag line. So you can kind of see right here this orange color associated with a drag line. That is what we would consider structural silk. So silk that is um, a certain um, protein uh, biochemical makeup that would help to provide the structural component of a web, or in this case, a drag line. And then you've got, um, let's see, uh, well, you can just see the different colors associated with the different glands. I want to move to a different picture because this one's great, and it shows you that there are different types of um, silk for different purposes. I'll, I'll point two more out. This is for um, attachment here, and then that is for wrapping prey. But this is what really got me a few years ago. Sorry, right here. Uh, this is what really got me a few years ago. This is from Science Magazine, which is a real pretty, like Scientific America. Um, this came out in 2017, and it was really the first time that we got a layman's sort of um, interpretation of what the biochemistry is telling us about the silk. And so um, if you want further details about the silk and you want to learn more of the biochemistry and how some of them make uh, almost like a zipper component to the silk to where it is even stronger. Um, if you want to learn more about um, the uh, how spider silk is stronger than Kevlar and yet flexible, um, it's also stronger than steel, FYI, which is, I think, very interesting. Um, it will also take you on a journey into understanding how scientists are studying how to replicate this in labs so that it can be used for wound care and other purposes. Go ahead. So, caveat, I'm not a witch, I'm a chemist, right, who studies medicinal Ooh, plants, good. and you talk about spider webs and some historical medicine recipes, and so based on this, and knowing that there are different proteins present in, di present in different webs and different spider creations, I don't know how to say Yeah, that's good. There, it could be medicinal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just haven't really gotten that far into it yet. Yeah, it would take a lot to think have an effect on a human, but other organisms for sure. If that you're talking about ingesting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, absolutely. And there's a whole lot more that we don't. There's a lot more that we don't know than we do know. But seven years ago was the first time this really brought to light that the, that the different glands that are producing the different kinds of silk do things that make it um, purposeful. So I mentioned the zipper. So some of the proteins that are produced make, it's almost like a zipper effect. And then if you have ever played with Legos, you know that it's not a zipper, but when you put a Lego like this and you try to pull it apart, it's almost impossible because of how it fits together. So one of the uh, descriptions in uh, this article tells us about how some of it does that, which is how the spider silk is able to stay in the web or in whatever formation, if it's around an egg sac, you know, as, as long as it does and why it doesn't break down when water hits it and why it doesn't break down in, in other capacities. So um, again, there's a whole lot that we don't know, but we're learning a lot more about that and it's fascinating. Yes, Jane. Do I remember reading that they genetically engineered a goat? Yep. Goat yeah, there's a group in Montana or Wyoming. I think it's in Wyoming now. Um, a, a, a lab up there where they are injecting the proteins, uh, the, the genetic material into goats, and then what they do is they extract the milk, and from the milk, they extract the silk, and that's how they can test the tensile strength, so they kind of just stretch it until it breaks, um, but they're also synthesizing the silk for these studies that I'm talking about, like trying to have a purpose for humans and other things, like wound care, because the product is natural and the product is, you know, doesn't, we don't have adverse effects to it and things like that. 
right, I want to go back to this one because I forgot I, I added this slide in here. This is just a cool picture, not mine, um, that you can go read or look at in um, Scientific Magazine, the, or, I'm sorry, The Scientist, and it shows you a uh, jumping spider at high speed photograph leaping across, that's three centimeters distance in that picture. And so the, um, the silk is illuminated by a red light so that you can see how it attaches the silk. So that would be considered a drag line. So it's basically like um, in the car, the oh what bar? The oh, oh yeah. yeah, where you hold on in case you, you, <laughs> you need help. That's what a drag line is in this case. So it's, if, if it misses its mark, then it has a place to go back and then it won't fall too far, or get too far away from where it wants to be. And will they do that every time they jump? Is that a standard? For a jumping spider, yes, because that's the way that they're going to hunt. So they can jump 50 times their body length by, uh, by hydrostatic force, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the life cycle. I think y'all, it's pretty simple life cycle where um, the spiders start off as an egg. So I, I put together here a series of pictures, um, mostly from my yard, but a couple I've borrowed um, that show you a, um, anybody know this species? Gasteracantha cancroformis, a spiny orb weaver. Some people call them moon spiders. Some people call them crab spiders. Skeleton spider. Okay, that's I've heard that before too, but not as commonly. No, Jack, Jack, skeleton. Jack skeleton. Okay, got it. So there's the adult, and um, so we have within Louisiana we have one species. No one's done the genetic work on it yet, so the I question if it's one species. But you'll see them with a dorsal color that's yellow, white, red, orange and sometimes the white with the red outline. So those are the varieties that we have here. I forgot to ask you, I forgot my watch, what time? I'll tell you. I'm good? Okay, good. Because I could talk spiders all day. All right, so this is a, a, a sexually mature female, and I know that because I had seen her lay eggs. Um, and comparable size right here, that's the male. So I didn't realize the male until I'd watched these in my yard for several years. The male in most cases in the spider world are what we call degenerate, which means they are... <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, did I say in the spider world? No. Um, so in the spider world, they're, they're considered degenerate because they are typically smaller. They typically live a shorter life, and they're usually, when, when you see them, not this one, but when you see some that forage on the ground, they're usually missing a lot of legs because they've been in a lot of fights. They usually are very skinny because they have one thing on their minds. <laughs> um, but in this case, you'll often find, if you're looking, once the female gets to that large size, you'll see one of these just hanging straight down on a string near the web. So you really have to look closely if you want to see this individual male of this um, species. And he will mate with her, um, and she can, uh, well, there's all kinds of fun stories. She can take his sperm or get rid of it. She can scrape it out if she wants to. Um, he doesn't stick around and protect her. There are some examples of insects and spiders where that does happen. But in this case, um, so she can mate with multiple males. So she could have multiple egg sacs um, with sperm from multiple males. So genetic diversity. Um, but this is what the, uh, the egg sac looks like. Oftentimes you'll see that dark line. Um, if any of y'all know my buddy Zach Lemon, um, a lot of people know Zach in the, in the state for his insect and spider work. Um, he's the one who first pointed out to me that um, he's never seen one of the egg sacs without that dark line in the middle of it. And uh, so then, of course, when I found one in my yard without it, I had to send it to him. I'm like, I found one without it. I, we don't know what it is or why it's there, um, but it's a diagnostic thing that you often see in this particular um egg sac of this spider. These are both on the underside of leaves. So if you find these as adults in webs in your yard, look under some of these leaves in the summer. They'll have multiple generations throughout the year um, into the fall, and you can um, certainly find their egg sacs. This is um, a master naturalist in New Orleans sent me this recently, and I said, can I use this in some of my talks? And he said, yes. So that's one that um, obviously sometimes they take what they can get, and this was on his car. This female lay in her egg sac. So look everywhere. 
So what happens next? Well, before we get to what happens next, I, I thought I'd just bring up real quick a couple of sh cool strategies that um, some of the males will go through in order to um, entice the female to choose him. So these are two photos from a, a, a journal article, not my photos, um, but they show a really cool um, strategy. In the top picture, that A up there, let me kind of point out what you're looking at. You've got the female spider that's right here and then you've got a male smaller but not much smaller in this case definitely a darker color um, so you can kind of differentiate the two this is um, a species called Pisara mirabilis it's a species we have here it's uh, related to the fishing spiders so one of the nursery web spiders and what he has done is taken a gift and wrapped it in silk to present to the female so the gift an insect and so the idea is the strategy is if she wants this insect as food she's going to take that insect she's going to eat it and while she's eating it he's going to inseminate her and not have to worry about being the prey himself even cooler i think uh, or or equally as cool in this case you've got a male um, if y'all have heard of tetragnatha which is one of our um, spiders that the long jawed spiders that we tend to find around water um, they are often posed like this on limbs near uh, in a riparian area if you get into a canoe they often fall in your canoe and they're real long and gangly it's because they need to be in a web otherwise they look awkward um, but this is a, a this is not one of our species but but closely related and it has wrapped a rival male and presented that to the female so that she will choose him so two birds one one meal I don't know so whatever it takes right um, so once the female is inseminated and um, there's again lots of variety with what happens next but if it is a successful reproductive um, event then she will lay some sort of egg sac like I showed you with the spiny orb weaver um, here are a couple of the, what I consider to be the cooler um, examples this is um, a picture not mine um, of a cellar spider that are uh, tend to be in um, in our uh, let's like parking garages and things you'll see them a lot um, in those areas this is her egg sac so I mean that is incredible so she does not wrap that in silk but she wraps the, the eggs together with the little pieces of silk so that they they hold together she holds those in her chalicery in her fangs until they start to emerge and then they go off on their own so when you find one of these you often find many of them because they don't venture far this is um, a nursery web spider that is um, holding her egg sac right here and so um, my dad took that picture and um, I like it because even though you don't see the spider very well you can see that she's holding on to that egg sac and so all of the fishing spiders and nursery web spiders that look very similar to wolf spiders for those of you who you know try to differentiate the two if you see an egg sac in the chalicery or, or being held with the pedipalps in the chalicery you know it's a nursery web spider because what do the wolf spiders do yeah they hold it on their abdomen with their spinnerets so that's just and those two spe uh, those two groups those two families are very closely related so that's one of the ways you can tell um, if they happen to have an egg sac and then the far right picture, um, my buddy James Beck, if any of y'all know, really great um, entomologist, took this picture of a green lynx, and um, you can really see the egg sac well um, from the side. So she's actually um, hangs out with hers as well. And so I show you three examples of females with their egg sacs. And it's almost like a, an example of parental care to an extent in an invertebrate, which doesn't happen often. Um, but those are exceptions because um, most of them will just lay that egg sac and then move on. Um, a lot of times the female dies or she moves on and creates another egg sac, etc. cetera. Uh, depends on the species. In the wolf spiders, they take it to the extreme. So they carry those egg sacs on with their spinnerets on their abdomen. And then once the young spiderlings are ready to emerge, they crawl on her back 
and she carries them around until they're ready to molt and go off on their own. And she will do everything she can to protect those. She won't eat. She won't do much at this point. Um, so a really fun and creepy thing to do is to go outside at night and you can put a flashlight or a headlamp on right by your face and look around for spider eyes and um, definitely something to do no matter what age you are. It's so fun. Um, but the really fun time when you do that, when you see so many of them together, you know it's a wolf spider with a bunch of spiderlings on her abdomen because you can just walk right up to it and see it. So if you follow the, um, we like to call it glitter everywhere, um, but those, the eye shine, it's, it's incredible. Um, this is an example of uh, the Dolomites or the fishing spider that um, it carries around the egg sac and then there's a certain cue that is given, we don't know what it is, but something that tells her, tells her to go and position the egg sac and she builds a nursery web, so basically just a mishmash of silk underneath it and then she goes off and usually dies. Um, and so uh, they then, once the spiderlings emerge, have a nursery a place for them to go until they're ready to molt their first time and move on, balloon off or, or whatever. Yeah. What is the incubation period for these spiders that are carrying It's around? species specific and it's temperature specific. What time do they carry around these egg sacs? What about them? They're not eating? No. Usually, I mean, spiders, um, they, they eat and eat and eat as long as they're molting, but once they become adults, that's why the males are usually so skinny at that point because once they become sexually mature, they don't eat again. They, um, I mean, in captivity they will, but in the wild they tend to not eat again. Um, and then the females, as long as she's protecting them, but they can regulate because they don't move that much. Uh, they, they can regulate their, um, their nutrients a little better. Um, longer lived species that we have here are wolf spiders and they can live three to five years. But again, it's species specific. With oh no no no, without e no, it'll take them a year or so to become sexually mature, and then. Uh, but the, so the ones that live longer, they will eat in, so after they've gotten rid of <laughs> their spiderlings. <laughs> That's terrible. Once the spiderlings have molted and moved on, they will eat again because they'll probably mate again and lay another set. Yep. So who eats spiders? Lots of things. They're an important part of our ecosystem services as, uh, as food. And one of the cooler examples is um, if you've ever seen tarantula hawks or mud daubers, which is a species of wasp, um, shown here. This is a former student of mine sent me this picture with the, that's a house spider that the spider, that this uh, wasp is holding. So what the mud daubers do is produce a home. You've probably seen it before, something like this. It's, um, it's usually like a column or it depends on the species. It can be just a little dirt ball. Um, but if you've ever had the opportunity to take one of those and, and remove it from its surface and you look at the other side, you see that it's full of chambers. And each chamber has a couple of spiders in it depending on the species, there are some wasp species that just put one spider per chamber. Um, but what this wasp does is it finds a, a prey item in the spiders, typically. Um, it lays an egg on the spider, well, sorry, paralyzes the spider, lays an egg on it, it doesn't kill it. Um, and so once the egg of the wasp hatches out and is in the larval stage and growing and developing, it has a food source. So it does all of that larval development inside of that chamber. So sometimes you'll open up the chamber and you will see living spiders. So you know that the egg or the larva is still in there. Sometimes you just see exoskeletons. And then sometimes you'll see the, pu the exoskeleton of a pupa of a wasp because it's already emerged out as an adult. So it does its development inside of there where it's protected. It has plenty food. And uh, at this point, the female, of course, has moved on. So it just is a temporary parental care, but still a form that, which is pretty cool. Have y'all seen these before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, everywhere, right? And of course, birds eat them and all that's for another talk. All right, so what do spiders eat? I think you probably know other spiders, insects, um, really anything that it can. And so if you look at pictures um, across the internet and find there's some really great photos, especially of um, 
this isn't a challenge for y'all. Y'all know that when you have native uh, species that have these incredibly bright and brilliant and, and um, ar aromatic flowers, they're going to attract the pollinators. And so there are some of these plants that you will typically find what's called a crab spider sitting inside of there waiting for an unsuspecting pollinator to show up. And so um, the crab spiders are called that because they hold their front two pair of legs like crabs do. And then usually their back two pair of legs are attached in some way so that it doesn't lose its traction. So um, you'll often find really cool photos um, of crab spiders with unsuspecting pollinators. This is another picture of a, a jumping spider, again, one that um, utilizes and can jump up to 50 times its body length. And then uh, here's uh, what my Uncle Larry would call a plant picture with a spider, but I call it a spider picture with a plant. So <laughs> here's a green, another green lynx, um, and apparently it's got a carpenter bee um, on that plant. So what plant is that? He said it. What's the common name? Um, that. That's what. <laughs> so hundreds and hundreds of plant pictures that happen to have spiders on them, and um, every once in a while I get some really good ones and uh, have to use those in my talks because they're great photos. How much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Oh, awesome. Okay, so one of the things that um, that if you leave here with nothing else about these spiders, that hopefully you realize that it's really cool to um, well as people who are interested in getting outside and seeing native things and, and, and trying to learn more about nature and, and what encompasses nature, um, one of the things that you need to know about spiders is, well, you need to know where to find them. And so not all of them build webs, even though, um, you know, I mean, years ago, Charlotte told us that they do. Um, and so, yes, a lot of them do build webs. And when they do, they're real easy to see. Um, they're obvious, especially if you go out early morning and they've got some dew on them. Um, and so this picture is a, a, what I consider to be a great picture to show you all in one place um, different types of webs based on the different types of spiders. And so for years, um, this would be one of the clues that we could use as spider biologists to try to identify the spiders. But if you don't have a web associated with them, or if you catch them and you forget, or there's a lot, there are other characters, those characters I showed you earlier. But one of the best characters is, if it does have a web, what kind of web it actually is. And so um, we tend to group the spiders into different families of spiders based on their web, like the very common orb web weavers. They all make an orb-shaped web. Or we call funnel web weavers. Or cobweb weavers. And so there are lots of examples, and this is a nice little um, photo that shows you examples of more, the, the more common um, types of webs. And this is a Scientific American um, article as well. But there's so much more to that study. And in fact, just about um, 13 years ago, there was a, uh, a study that came out by Cardoso and others that suggested, you know what, we need to break down spiders based on their guilds. So the based on the way in which they get their food, because that's kind of what we were doing anyway. There's a lot of different web types. There's 135 species, I mean, families of spiders. So that's a lot to, to remember. So this proposal of breaking down by spider guilds is something that I've embraced because I think it helps especially a novice um, start really understanding how to look for spiders and where. And then it also tells you a little bit about their behavior and it helps you get that search image and there's only eight of them. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a little journey real quick of those eight guilds and some of them are, you're, you're probably going to be familiar with. The first picture up there is what we would call all of the spiders and, and so let me back up a minute. That would help us narrow down to how we would identify the spiders. So by knowing what its guild is, then we could um, get closer to the family and then hopefully eventually the species, which is actually very difficult to do. 
in a lot of cases. So the first one is called Sensing Web Weavers. And the example I have there for you is um, what's called, the, I, forever it didn't have a common name, it's Ariadna Bicolor. But there's a new book out that put a common name to it, so I can now call it the Tube Web Spider, which makes perfect sense because when you see these often on human constructed handrails, if you look at them from the side, it's a, a very short but yet a tube is what they live in. And what they do, you can guess by the name of the guild, is they kind of sit out on the, the periphery of their tube where they're protected on the inside. This species happens to be nocturnal, so when you go out at night and you're looking, you can see little legs at the end. And they are not... Uh, well, essentially what they're doing is they are waiting for vibrations that cross their t the end of their tube. So those little silk pieces there, they put the ends of their feet on, and as soon as there's a vibration, they go out, they try to grab the prey and bring it back in. So a fun thing we learned years ago is you can take a little um, dental tool, if you want, or pine straw or something and you can put it at the end and they'll come out and try to grab it so fun things you can do with spiders so that's um, the two web spider the middle picture are what we refer to as sheet web weavers so again if you go out in the morning across and there's a meadow or city park or wherever you are and you see little tiny webs all in the grass or you see them in the shrubs and things like that on the north shore wherever um, or these what are known as funnel web spiders those are all going to be what we refer to as sheet sheet web weavers. So anything that looks like a sheet. So typically the hunting mode is that the spider hangs out in, in the funnel, in the back, um, and what in the front we call the apron. And so it when something lands on the apron and the fly or whatever it is starts to struggle, the spider will let the silk do some of the work and then go out, grab the, the um, prey, and then bring it back into its little funnel where it's protected. These are really hard to catch if you've ever tried um, because they always have a, it seems like they always have a funnel down into the base of a tree or something where they're very protected. And then the third picture over there is your typical orb web weaver. And that is um, a very common spider that we have in our state, um, the yellow garden spider, sometimes referred to as the yellow and black garden spider. Do not call it a banana spider. You're no longer allowed to call it a banana spider. Nope, even though they're yellow, um, because there are other spiders that we refer to that, and it's more appropriate. Uh, this is the one you see that builds the stable omentum, or that big zigzag in the middle. Um, there are different contrasting hypotheses about that, whether it's to prevent birds from flying through it or to attract insects because the ultraviolet that um, insects use to see that, um, but the, the jury's still out on that. We don't really know exactly why they built it. It's definitely not, it's been, it's been um, refuted that it's actually for stabilizing, which is how it first got its name. Yeah? The guilt that's been proposed, that would, will or would that be part of the taxonomic list? It depends on your reference. So there's a new book out, um, newish, I think it's a couple years old now, that takes you, you figure out the guild, then it takes you to a dichotomous key where you can then get it down to family and then go from there. So it, if you're using an older book, it's not going to be set up in guild because that's a very new proposed method for grouping. Yeah, Pat? No theory on whether this particular spider intentionally uh, it uh, intentionally, um, it, no, it, I mean, I, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's by virtue of where they tend to live and where it's usually an open space as they get bigger and their silk is incredibly strong with, even within the spider, um, group. And so I think it's just by happenstance. I don't know I, if there's literature out there. I don't know about it being intentional. Yeah. Um, three more listed here out of the eight. So we got space web weavers, which is just a big old cobweb. Just when you see something that's not symmetrical at all or doesn't have much shape. So the best example of one that you would have around is in the widow family. So brown widows are really taking over urban areas um, and black widows, another good example. 
And um, so that's, it's just, um, it's called a cobweb and there's just, it's no symmetry at all. Um, the middle picture is an ambush hunter. So anything that sits and waits for its um, food to come by. In this case, this is a six spotted fishing spider, always associated with water. In this picture, which I think is a great photo of this Dolomites, its back legs are in hunting mode, which is exactly how you would expect them to be. That's like textbook right there. So I happened to catch it one day, luckily. Um, its back two sets of legs are resting on something, usually vegetation, and its front two pair of legs are out on the water, waiting for something to swim by, or for an insect, an invertebrate to fall from the tree and then get caught up. And so um, that's how they got their name, fishing spider, because there are cases of them eating um, small fishes like gambusia and things, uh, little mosquito fish. And then ground active hunters, that's another uh, wolf spider that's shown there. I don't know the exact species, um, and that's in the Barataria unit. She's got babies all over her back as well. Um, same thing, they, um, they're not, they don't sit and wait, but they don't move very much. But they do move around when they need to avoid being eaten and when they are looking for food. And then the last two, um, grouped as other active hunters, um, this is because it's a different kind of hunting. This is the, um, the best example are the jumping spiders, and it's a very big group. One of our common jumping spiders that we have around here is the Sylvana jumping spider, a gorgeous one. That picture doesn't even do it justice when you look at um, better photos. And then the um, spider hunters, so some... Um, families of spiders specialize in eating other spiders. One great example is the pirate spider. Mimetus is the genus to which they belong. Um, my pictures of Mimetus that we have here are terrible, so I chose to use one from the web so you could kind of get an idea of what they look like. But they're typically hiding under leaves and um, waiting for other spiders to just walk along and then they, they grab them when they're not prepared. Yeah. Um, those last few that you showed, they don't make webs? Um, so, so I've seen my Mimetus, uh, the pirate spider, with a web, but it was with a web with a spider in it. So I think it was more a function of it had wrapped up its prey and eaten it. So most of the pictures that you see of pirate spiders are like this, where it's um, on a tree or something like that. But I don't know them well, so I can't. I don't want to answer. I mean, but that's the way I've seen them in the in the field. How they classify the gills? This earlier ones, they are classified by the type of web. By the type of web. Classified by behavior. Correct. Yep. By the way in which they get their food. Because one thing I, I didn't mention: active versus passive. So I mean, when they're they're passive feeders, typically when it's a web setting, active when it's when it's not. Good question. Um, well, let's tie in some plants. Okay, so hopefully you've been challenging yourselves, um, but here's a couple. That's the same picture of the fishing spider, so that ties in the plant. So two um, of Larry Alain's pictures here, um, goldenrod, crab spider. That one, explain that to me. The other ones, typically they're camouflaged in with the spider, I mean with the, the plant. In this case, it's bright, like almost like don't come to this flower and pollinate it because I'm right here. But maybe it's because the middle is, you know, yellow. Who knows? Um, but look for that now while you're out and about and looking at, um, before you smell the roses, make sure you look in there. Um, and then I just love that other picture of the, um, the uh, cone flower with the green links on it. And apparently green links love prairies. The prairie, uh, coastal prairies, yeah. Very common, cool. Um, and then I just put a couple of pictures of, um, of the within the families just to show you some more popular ones. You can certainly ask me questions about any of them, but um, I just there's a couple of pictures that I thought. I mean, I've already talked about the gastrocantha, but Neoscona is the um, the spotted orb weaver. That's just a picture of its ventral surface and a, a lateral view. Just because I get a lot of pictures that look like that from people, like what is this species? Often you need to be able to see both their dorsal, their lateral, and their ventral view when it's um, one of those big orb weavers, unless it's the lichen orb weaver, which is easy. But um, a lot of times that's what it takes to identify those. You can narrow it down easily based on its web, that it's an orb web weaver. But then to get it beyond that, you need more characters. So just show you some of those. Yeah, Pat? I have no idea. The record for the biggest wolf spider. Do you know the answer? No. No, okay. <laughs> 
uh, fluorescent spiders you see at night. Are you talking about the mycosis eye Oh, the eye shine. So they have a, a layer of tissue known as a tapetum, kind of like when you put uh, your lights on a cat at night. It's that same idea where it reflects back. Um, and so not all spiders have it, but the wolf spiders all have it and several other species do too, several other groups. One other quick question. Yep. That's a defense mechanism for you don't see me. You don't see me at all. Back away. Um, you'll see, um, uh, what is it, daddy long legs will do that. They'll bounce up and down. Um, the cellar spider I showed you earlier, with that, I mean, it never fails. You can walk up to it and blow on it, and it does the same thing. Garden spiders, yep, a lot of them do because if it's the thought is is a strategy for defense. Yeah. Are you looking at the I didn't hear you. Oh no, um, he asked about the jaw spider. I actually have a spider that's related to it. Let me show you. Y'all probably all know our largest spider, which is the golden silk spider. So the jaw spider is. Um, in the same genus as this, and it's an invasive that has come in. I think the last I looked on iNaturalist, it's a little bit north of us, but they haven't made it to us yet. I don't know if that's changed or not. I haven't looked in a while. But um, uh, Japan, they're an Asian species, yeah. It looks a lot like ours, but, um, but a different um, species. But that, that's the largest spider we have. Um, that picture right there I love be on the far right because that's actually a male right here in the front. So you can, this, you're looking at the ventral surface of the female there and then the male right in front. So there, um, we would refer to that in, um, as being sexually dimorphic, meaning dimorphic two forms. And I showed y'all that. I didn't use that terminology earlier with the gastrocantha, but same, same idea. This is another common, that's the one I mentioned that you'll often see around water, um, the long-jawed oar weaver. And this, who knew? I mean, every time I go out, I find these. That is Leucage venusta, and it is called the orchard spider. And they are everywhere in the state. And uh, they're easy to identify because of their color, but you do have to, when, when they're fully grown like this one is, it's, it's pretty easy. When they're smaller, it's a little harder. But they're always in an orb web, and they're always oriented in the same way. So once you learn that, it's one of those characters and one of those search images that you will never forget. Um, same thing with the golden silk. They're always oriented in a vertical fashion. Yeah? The golden silk, you're calling it golden silk when I was a little kid, of course. We call it golden orb weaver. Did oh, you know, same thing. Weaving web? Yes. Okay, they used to be orb weavers, but they've now been moved over. And actually, some people still keep them in the orb weaver group. And also, what is, like, and I don't study spiders, so what is the, like, the dosage or in volume of venom that a spider injects, like what's the range on that? Like is it what I've read, and, and I don't do this research at all, but what I know just from the past reading about it, it differs depending on a few things. One is the size of the, uh, the prey, and also if it has been entangled and has slowed its movement. If it hasn't, there's usually more venom. Because what the venom does, it not only slows them down, but it turns their insides to liquid so that they can then um, eat suck out the juice, if you want to think of it like that, from the, the prey. And, yep, exactly. Venom is it, you know, like, how, how is that produced? Is it in a, um, like, a venom sack? Yep, they have glands as well. I just glazed over that. Yeah, they have glands. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on the spider. So the two spiders that we have around here that you should – you know, be aware of, and then you don't have to worry about the other ones, um, are the, y'all tell me, brown recluse, black widow. So the brown recluse has a bite, has a, a toxin that is a hematoxin. So it's a tissue toxin. So it's going to be, if it bites you right here, it's going to be localized right here. And so you will see the radiation and the degradation of your tissue radiate out from a central area and it's not going to spread that far. So if you had to pick, you would pick this one because the other one is a neurotoxin and um, the brown widow and the black widow have it and it will affect your nervous system. And you wouldn't know it right away. It would take a while to affect you and then eventually it would slow your um, heart from beating. And yep. But it depends on the amount that's if you 
if you go and read any of the medical journals, there are so few articles that positively link a spider bite with um, a person, a patient, um, a case. Yeah. When, um, I guess sometimes doctors see necrosis and they automatically link yep. the... Um, Brown recluse? Yeah. So it's often uh, staph infection. It's Oh, yes. Yep. A lot of times it's a staph infection. So, um, I mean, it's in either case, you should go get it checked out. I mean, that's when I have friends that send, they're like, my child got, I'm like, whatever, just go to urgent care and let them scrape it. And either way, you're, you're going to be okay. <laughs> you should be okay. Yeah. Me? Yep. Hey, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Hardy, knowing that, and he always likes the, the golden book, the golden guide to spiders. Yep. What's the best new book out there? Okay. Well, so I got used to carry a golden book around forever. Yeah. Um, and I actually have the book right here. Yeah. Um, but I just I just got it this year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.